recording good so um the last time we talked we started to talk about batch rl and uh didn't get very far <laughs> and how far we got i'm going to revise it today uh so i'm going to do reduce some of the things that we were doing in the last uh, the, the last time so i want to talk about three things hopefully i will get to the end of this so the first is better error control for this model misspecification so the last time we talked about that if you have a model uh, if, if you're an MDPM and somehow you model it with an M hat MDP and, and this had uh, transitions and rewards PR and this has P hat and R hat, then if you plan for M hat, some policy, let's call it P hat, and then you deploy it in M then uh, what can we expect regarding how good this policy is going to be in the original MDP? And uh, so that's that means we want to have a lower bond on the values. And, and we got some lower bonds on the values, which were not too great. It was like, I don't know, 1 over 1 minus gamma cube. And then I think the error in the transitions and the error in the rewards. And uh, if you have N uh, observations for each state action pair, you're like in this very simple setting, uh, then you can expect uh, these quantities, both the reward and transitions, uh, to be off water one over root 10 and so that meant that the number of observations uh, right uh so th this is for every s a pair and uh so the total number of observations that uh, you need to get this error below an epsilon would be something like of the order of uh, let's let's call this one over one minus gamma the age it's going to be like h to the six <laughs> over epsilon squared and and maybe there is a log one over data if you want to do this with uh that's a zeta if you want to do it with property one minus zeta and this is way too high uh Today, I'm going to talk about some techniques to reuse this to h cube epsilon squared. Oh, there is an essay here. And, and the reason to talk about these techniques, so it's h cube essay. It's, it's OK, this is very messy. Um, so the reason it's worthwhile to, to spend some time on this is because these techniques uh, to reduce this complexity, this dependence on this, this horizon um, are applicable beyond this, this very simple setting. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to know these techniques and how is this possible? And apparently, there is a lower bound. That shows that this sample complexity, as they say, is un unimprovable. So that's for the sampling, where you're sampling each state action pair a number of times, but in a lot of cases, it's not really realistic uh, 
that you will be able to you know jump to specific state action pairs uh data collection usually happens using by following policies And here we're going to primarily discuss a lower bound. It's going to show that following policies, even if you try to choose, so to say, the best policy, you don't really have much to go with. So you can feel that this is going to be hard. Because if you start to follow a policy, then maybe the chances of visiting the state action pairs, which are really important to decide what to do, are going to be tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and because of that, um, passive data collection by following policies is exponentially worse than if you can do data collection by jumping to state action pairs. So there was data collection here up to now by sampling uh, state action pairs. So you have like really, really strong control over how you're passively getting the data. There was nothing active here. We decided to, to get the data in a passive way. Um, but it happens that, well, this is not too realistic. And, and if you stick to just following policies, which would be more realistic in, in more scenarios, then the lower bound is going to tell us that, uh, I don't know, something like A to the age um, samples are going to be necessary. A to age, um, sorry, trajectories, independent trajectories are going to be necessary to get um, epsilon uh, accuracy with uh, some positive probability, like one force probability. So if you want algorithms that, uh, if you're interested in, you know, I collect some data by following some policies, and then my algorithm goes and processes the data, and it has to spit out a policy. And I want this policy to be epsilon optimal with probability at least one fourth, not too much. Uh, then um, there is always, no matter how you choose the algorithm, there is always an MDP such that under the MDP, uh, the algorithm is not going to need this many trajectories, A to the H trajectories. Actually, it's, it's H to, A to the H, where H is uh, the effective horizon at accuracy gamma and epsilon. Right, so uh, this is really bad because uh, this means that this uh, can be a very large number, right? <laughs> it's like we are kind of back to the trees, uh, but there is absolutely no structure. So this is when there is no limit on how many states you have. So maybe it's not too surprising, right? Uh, you can just get lost. And uh, for this, you only need eight states. With eight states, you can get this lower bound. And uh, for eight states, so for if, if you have eight states, then if you had this, this type of sampling, this, this SA sampling, this very controlled sampling, then uh, we would get this, this upper bound here, right? So with SA sampling, 
pretty much every algorithm that you can think about, it just like goes in, builds an MDP. You solve the MDP with your favorite algorithm, and you're gonna get H cube and H A over epsilon squared. After this many uh, trajectories, this probability one minus, uh, sorry, after this many uh, samples, so here the total number of samples, by the way, is, is going to be h times a to the h, because each trajectory, yeah, I didn't say that, is going to be off length h. And so here you need this many samples, h times uh, a to the power of h. And here with sa sampling, you need this many samples. So this is clearly polynomial in all the relevant quantities, and this is exponentially in h. Um, so trajectory-based sampling might be necessary and applications, but it can be really, really bad for you if you're not able to control, um, like in a in a in a smoothed way. Like you know, the problem is that this is going to be highly non-uniform. So you choose whatever behavior policy blindly. And then I can choose the MVP, then I choose an MVP such that that behavior policy is not going to go to see whether there is some reward in some important state. And that, that creates this problem. All right, um, so that's the plan. You might ask why we choose uh, to have trajectories of length age. Um, you can have longer trajectories, but you will only waste your time with longer, longer trajectories because uh, the planning horizon is age. So anything beyond those uh, that length, you might end up in parts of the state action space and nothing really matters. So for us from the starting state, you know, like it's just too far, like whatever you would learn uh, there, it doesn't matter. So you can make the trajectories longer. That doesn't help. If you make the trajectories shorter, then you're going to miss critical information. This is the critical length that you need to gain just enough information. Much longer trajectories don't make sense. Much shorter trajectories don't make sense either. OK. All right. Um, so now on to the better error bound. Yeah, this is okay. So there was a question uh, whether in three uh, the policy assumes the worst behavior policy. No, this assumes the best behavior policy. So it, the statement is that no matter how you choose the behavior policy, um, so for every pi behavior policy, I can find the MDP such that this behavior policy is not going to work. Uh, otherwise, it would be silly because, uh, well, we can choose a behavior policy which doesn't choose some action. And maybe that action is the optimal action. So uh, somehow we are interested in the best possible way of collecting data here. And then what we find is that if we are restricted to trajectory-based sampling, even with the best possible way that you can Im imagine, um, you are you're not going to get too far. It's a pretty dire situation. No matter what behavior policy you choose, you, no matter what sampling plan you have, things are bad. Um, oh yeah, so before we, we jump into uh, the first uh, subtopic, um, let me note that, uh, so planning was the absolutely interactive way. 
it's the okay so this axis is level of interaction so that's maximum and so in some way uh maybe these behavior policies are like this so following behavior policies is just like the weakest form and sa sampling is somewhere in between there could be something in between as well which is uh you know maybe you can adapt um sorry uh behavior policies uh so you have a behavior policy but you can change the lengths of trajectories adaptively so as you're going maybe you're gonna cut some trajectories short but you can't change the policy and then if you uh also allow to change the policy then you get something that is potentially better than assay sampling um i i presume it's going to be here so this is like you can adapt but you don't see the rewards so during data collection it's just like you don't see the rewards so this is uh, a reward free exploration if you wish and i'm not going to talk much about it that's not batch learning right so that's online learning Uh, but you can imagine that um, you do that, you're collecting data, and then someone later on tells you what the reward function was, and, and then you need to act. Uh, there's some papers about it. That's not a bad thing. In reward-free exploration, you can somehow balance of how uniformly you're visiting the state action pair. So it's, it's kind of in the same ballpark as assay sampling, I think. All right, so back to uh, error control. So you have M. And you have this M hat. We designed some policy here. And we expect that the value function of this policy is going to be close to optima because we ran our planner and this is a near optima policy in this uh, learned MDP. Um, I put hats on, on the quantities that are specific to uh, the, the surrogate MDP. And uh, we are interested in how well this policy is going to do in the original MDP. And uh, yeah, so we can just like add and subtract a bunch of terms. So subtract the uh, optimal value function of the approximate MDP, and you have to add it back. And then We expect that our policy's uh, value function is close to the optimal value function in this uh, approximate MDP. So the second term should be nice and small. And then that is the third term, which is the difference between the value function of the policy, and the approximate MDP and the, the actual MDP. And, and if we want, we can upper bound this, and it's, this is going to be useful uh, by just here, instead of using the optimal value function, let's use the value function of the policy, which is optimal in the original MDP. So here, pi star is optimal in M, it's not necessarily optimal in M hat, and therefore its value function is smaller. 
And since we are subtracting a smaller value, we get something bigger. So this is nice because now we see that we need to control basically two terms of identical type, this and this. So these terms are like you have a policy, maybe it's based on M or M hat, and you're comparing the value function of this policy in M versus M hat. You can suspect how this is going to go. Uh, this should be uh, this should be not hard to control. And then there is the optimization error. The optimization error is controlled by the planner. So earlier we said that, that oh that's epsilon, so that that term would be bounded by epsilon. So that's fine. So it remains to see uh, what we can do if we have a policy pi. Maybe it's going to be either pi star or it's going to be pi hat. And, and for this policy, we want to control how much the value function of the policy deviates uh, if you calculate it either in M or M hat. And so this is a sort of a value difference, but now the difference comes from, it's not because the policies are different, but it's because the underlying MDPs are different. And uh, for simplicity, let's assume that R is equal to R hat. This allows me to write uh, less. Nothing really changes if you uh, Handle the general case, you just have some additional terms. Uh, and we have seen previously that the dependence on, on the deviation in R is, is never so critical. So you just trust me that like this works out fine. Uh, so it's more serious to, uh, to understand the, the errors in the transition, probably these are, are the serious source of the error, not, not the rewards. And so for simplicity, just assume this. And same way as in the value difference identity, when we derive that, it's almost the same thing. You start by writing what the, how the value function looks like, I guess. I still randomly put the policy index in the upper index or the lower index. I will try to be consistent. So here, notice that I can use the same reward. And in the value difference identity, uh, we just pulled out one of the inverses and then we, we were left with the others. But here, the two matrices differ. And so um, we want to somehow work with this difference. And when you see expressions like this, just think about the scalar case. What would you do if you have, you know, one over one minus X minus one over Y minus Y? What would you do? Uh, But just algebra, right? It's common denominator. Um, so you would just like say that ah, this is this is this, right? Okay, so what is this? X minus Y divided by one minus X times one minus Y. All right. So what works for scalars? Doesn't always work for matrices, but sometimes it does. Many times you have something really similar to what you see with scalars. So it's always like when you when you face a challenge like this, oh, we want to understand the deviation of these two things, and like, oh, can I do this with scalars? Oh yes, in scalars, it's it's simple, right? Like 
here the understanding is that this would be uh, p of pi and this is p head of pi and we expect the difference of p pi and p head of pi to kind of control uh, how uh, big the difference between these two inverses are uh, and then still multiplying with the inverses. So with matrices, you have to uh, just think carefully about that left and right multiplication are not the same. So we're going to pull out. But we kind of understand that we have to pull out these inverses because that corresponds to this common denominator thing. So let's, let's pull out the inverse here. And on the... On the left side, we, we also bring the reward because it's just like it's attached to that matrix already. So here we pull out the other matrix. And then since the reward is there, it's like it's just like have to carry. <laughs> it, it, like you, you don't have a choice in not, not pulling the reward with you. So you just pull the reward. And now we have to work out what to write here and what to write here. And we're going to put a minus between the two. And uh, so the product of, of these and whatever is there and like whatever is there should be the first term. So what to write there? Uh, well, we have to basically just cancel this guy. So we have to write this. I minus gamma hat and if you think about the other guy so here uh, this matches that so this is the extra guy we have to cancel that and voila we have the same thing as in the scalar case can pull out a gamma Right, and then it's shorter to write it with value functions. And here I can pull out this mpi. So just to emphasize that we first have these two transition colors and then we specialize it to a policy. Um, and this was the value function of pi in the approximate model. All right. So we have that. Ooh. Come on. The value difference is equal to just this gamma times uh, this, this inverse operator and then m pi and then the kernel difference is applied to the value function of policy pi in uh, in the MVP like that, that corresponds to the second guy here. Of course, the, you can have a symmetric relationship. Uh, okay. How is this going to help us? Well, it's, it's an immediate big help. Because um, so, if you want to bond uh, the deviation, then uh, this part alone can be upper bonded, as we have done it many times, by gamma over one minus gamma. And then we have to bond pi minus pi hat v hat of pi in infinity norm. And so this means controlling the errors at every state action pair. Um, and uh, this guy is of the order of one over one minus gamma. And so these n observations in uh, each of those uh, um, 
in each of the state action pairs. If we didn't have the hat here, uh, it would be a little bit simpler. So let's let's just like cheat a little bit. So this this guy here. So this is of order one over minus gamma. Then this is going to be of order of. Um, well, we have to apply a union bond over all state action pairs. Uh, okay, so the, the error probability is zeta. So this probability one minus zeta. Uh, this is of this order. Okay. And, ooh, what happened here? Okay. I guess I just started in the middle of some other lecture. And uh, now uh, we can uh, plug back in uh, into this first guy. So we get that V star, sorry, V hat V pi hat minus V star. Is upper bounded by um, gamma over one minus gamma. Oh, uh, there is a one over one minus gamma I'm missing here because this is of order of this size. So, so that's what we should have there. And so from that comes a factor of two. And there is this log guy divided by n plus the second term was the optimization error, which is epsilon. And uh, this is the second guy. And uh, the third guy is of the same order as the first guy. So we have a factor of two. And now if we need to uh, make this whole thing below, uh, so let's say there is no, epsilon, there is no optimization error, so. So this is the optimization error. Uh, let's say uh, this is zero. Uh, for simplicity, just interesting sample complexity and you need to solve that. This is the whole thing is smaller than equal to epsilon. So you have um, epsilon optimality. What am I doing? Right, the other way around. Um, then, then you get that n has to be um, of um, h to the four, and uh, this locked bulk guy um, over epsilon squared, and so we reduced uh, h to the six to h to the four. That is some advance. There was some cheating going on here. It's a little cheat. Um, so we like uh, addressing the cheat. Um, it's best done together with a further reduction in the complexity. So how do we go from h squared to to Sorry, h to the fourth to h to the third. How do we do that? <laughs> so we already cheated. We got h to the four. Maybe that's even optimistic. And no, I want to further reduce these things. Um, well, we see that it's one over one minus gamma are coming from. So there is one, one over one minus gamma coming from this calculation here, which was just this, um, sorry, this value difference identity, that is this one over one minus gamma coming from there. You can't really do much with that. Uh, and there is a second one over one minus gamma that's coming from here when we say that, well, we just apply Hofding's inequality uh, for each state action pair and then use the unknown bond. 
and uh, this this is where the looseness is. So this is this is loose. So what's better than Hovding's inequality? So where? So Hovding is sometimes tight, right? Like worst case, it's like it's, you can't improve it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are not special cases that you could improve upon it. So Hovding. It's worst case tight. So if you choose the worst, worst distribution, then you can't improve upon Hovding. Subject to the constraint, you know, that the support was bounded. Hovding only uses that. The worst distribution is going to be when it's just like the two ends of the interval are selected with equal probability. That's the worst distribution. And, and on that distribution, it's like the generalization of Bernoulli. Uh, no one can do better than Hovding. But a lot of distributions are not like that. And maybe if you're going to get lucky, and one inequality, so there are lots of variations of, of these uh, concentration inequalities, but one inequality which is very often useful is called Bernstein's inequality. Um, which almost uniformly improves upon her thing. So it's it's kind of neat. So how does this work? So Bernstein's inequality is also for okay, let, it has multiple versions, but like one standard version is is for the case when you have an IID sequence of random variables and some range from like without loss of trinity zero to I don't know. Give me a give me a letter mm, B. All right, good choice. And and they, these are um, well, simply to the IID. That's that's good enough for us. You can relax that assumption. Um, and as usual. Um, we calculate the sample mean. We want to understand how much the sample mean deviates from the common mean. So pick any of the random variables, take its expected value as the common mean. And uh, Bernstein's inequality is going to say that for every z, this probability one minus z, or zeta, zeta, zeta. Um, this deviation is not more. And here is the improvement. We put in the standard deviation of these random variables. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So that's like, instead of the scale, in Hovling, you had the scale, you had B there, right? That was the range. So now you have the, the standard deviation there. And um, okay, the constant gets a little bit worse. And um, okay, you have to use a unum bound because it's two-sided. And that is a correction term where the range is going to appear. And the constant that is two third. Okay, so uh, for this IID sequence, which takes values in zero B, uh, the deviation between the sample mean and the true mean is probably one minus zeta is at most this quantity here. Okay, so this is zeta, like that zeta. Like this, uh, you know, in concentration inequalities, the, you, you don't have this problem that that is already taken. You just usually just say it's probably one minus that or something, something else. But like, we like to use data for other things. So 
we have a clash. Uh, so I try not to make this mistake, but I will probably make the mistake of messing up the delta and the zero. Anyways, um, so this is what happens. And, and to compare it with Hovding, in Hovding you just had log 2 over zero divided by 2n. But here, this was multiplied by b. OK, and we didn't have this other term. And in terms of sample complexity, like you see that here, like if you want to make uh, this right hand side smaller than epsilon, right? Then here, the sample size is going to be like b squared over epsilon squared for Hovding and for Bernstein. Uh, that is the first term. From the first term, like the B doesn't appear. So it's with Bernstein, this sample sum size control, it's going to be that like, oh, both terms should be smaller than like, let's say epsilon half. Okay, so N uh, because of the first term has to be smaller than equal to, uh, so greater than equal to uh, sigma squared divided by epsilon squared, okay, like there is some log, there are some constants, let's not worry about that. And uh, that's because of the first term, and because of the second term, n has to be bigger than what? Oh, it is just b over epsilon. That's much better, right? And so for epsilon small enough, this is the dominating term. So what, what is small enough? So small enough means that, that this guy is bigger than this guy. So then, then this, this guy is the dominating term. Uh, and this always holds if epsilon is smaller than or equal to uh, sigma squared over b, right? So the story is that you can improve on sample complexity using Bernstein's inequality. Uh, for precision, which is smaller than variance squared divided by range. Okay, so that's gonna be a number. Like for high precision, Bernstein just improves upon half thing. It doesn't matter what, uh, what sigma squared was, sigma squared is at most b, uh, b, b squared, right? Like, uh, so this is never much worse than b. I mean, okay, so that, that's silly. Scratch that. Um, so what happens to, to our case? Well, we don't know what's the variance. Um, what is the variance that we're talking about? Whose variance are we talking about? Oh, here is where Hovding was applied. So this was Hovding. So sneakily we were applying Hovding here at every state action pair. So how did that work? Um, so we had here p minus p hat, and then this v pi guy. And we need to control the supreme norm of this. That means that we have to control it for every state action pair. So we just take this. What is this? Well, it is just the average of the value function, the average value, if you are starting from the state action pair, minus if you denote the samples that you derive from this fixed uh, state action pair by S1 up to, uh, sorry, S1 prime up to Sn prime, so this is just the sample that is private to the state action pair. Um, then this was 
the Empirica distribution. And so if you take the inner product of the Empirica distribution and this function, then what you get is, is something totally, truly intuitive. It is just the sample mean of the function when you plug in SI prime into the function. It, that's just algebra, right? It's like this PRFAS was defined as the Empirica distribution underlying this sample. So P head of AS S prime, this was in the like last lecture, uh, was uh, just, you know, you, you, you go through your, your sample and you're gonna count how many times you're hitting this particle state S prime and no take the inner product with respect to S prime, trivial algebra gives you what we have. Okay, so we were applying Hovding's inequality to this guy. So we must be talking about the variance of this guy. Okay, so X of I in the application of Hovding, and now we want to apply Bernstein, uh, Bernstein. Uh, is going to be, you know, the simple mean minus, and then just like one of these guys. And so this has zero mean, it's fine. It has some bounded range. Uh, it's actually, okay, it's, it's between minus one over one minus gamma and one over one minus gamma, but you can refine all of this so that like you can still stick to the zero to one over one minus gamma. Uh, well, you actually, yeah, like just don't do this, like just, the xi, yeah, because we were subtracting uh, the mean. So the xi is just going to be um, v of pi of si prime, right? Like it's just it's that thing, right? We don't have to subtract. Like when there are two ways of writing these inequalities, either these are zero mean or they are not zero mean. I was writing it with a not zero mean version, then here you subtract the mean. So I, I stick to that. So this is a non-zero mean version of it, then uh, this is just your xi. And uh, the uh, the expectation of xi is, is, of course, it's just like this other quantity. And what, what is the variance of xi? And how big is this variance? So let's call the variance of xi. Uh, sigma um, squared pi and SA. So it's a variance function. For every SA, you have some variance. And yeah, you can't say much about this variance. Like it's it, this variance is still on its own can be as large as one over one, one minus comma squared. There is nothing much you can do with it. So at this stage, you might call it a defeat because in Bernstein, you have sigma appearing, like in, in the range. And so that's again, like just one over one minus comma. And like, okay, that's like close down shop, game over, let's go home. Um, but not so fast. So there is another twist on the story, which is that, okay, this variance on its own could be big, but if you just take this variance function, um, oh gosh, okay. You just take this variance function then it happens that this variance function has some nice property. The nice property it has is that if you take the average, okay, not the variance, but the standard deviation
and um, okay here I have to take an average over the actions then you can show that this guy itself is not big you can show that this is of the size of at most two over one minus gamma cube so somehow this is the uh, discounted I don't know standard deviation of value and uh, for some magical reason this is not big okay so that's that makes us a little bit more hopeful so now we have to go back to see where we would be well there is this like multiplication with this inverse matrix but if we look back we have seen this guy before actually it's here so all this is is here so if we swap this with the variance then the whole thing can be controlled by uh with the square root of the cube and so that kind of means that like mm, it's like it's a leap that you can think about that the sigma p is really of the size of one over one minus gamma on the average Uh, because uh, one one over of a minus gamma is coming from here. So here, this is just uh, one over of one minus gamma, and then the square root of one over of a minus gamma, and this is uh, sorry, uh, the that's for the standard deviation. So for the variance, the like the average range should be of order of one over of a minus gamma. So that should make us hopeful, because if that is the case, then we see that in Hovding, we could only work with something as big as this, but maybe with Bernstein, we can work with quantity of this size. And uh, then putting everything together, we see that, well, if, uh, okay, so or sigma sigma squared, I said, is going to be what uh, one over one minus um, what sigma squared one over one minus gamma, and the b is uh, one over one minus gamma. So here uh, the precision doesn't have to be too small for a precision up to one we would be fine um, so for for epsilon smaller than one we are good um, and uh, we also see that the sample complexity just because of uh, sigma squared uh, would be of one over one minus gamma so that's like the horizon uh, horizon over epsilon squared uh, and uh, there is there is another horizon square that's coming from uh, this other one over of minus gamma that uh, that we're gonna have at the end. So that is going to bring this up to h cube. Um, and yeah it's like the the full calculation is not that simple uh it takes a few pages a few more pages 
but I think that uh, what's important here is that Bernstein's inequality, if you have some luck with the variance, allows you to uh, achieve a better sample complexity. And uh, the other, like the identity that's super useful in MDPs, which has, it's just a property of MDPs that this uh, average discounted standard deviation in the MDPs is of a smaller range than could be predicted by just looking at the ranges. So the average uh, standard deviation is, is, is a nice quantity. And uh, very often when people are hunting uh, gaps between lower bonds and upper bonds in terms of the sample complexity as it depends on the planning horizon, the tool that you need to bring to the table is pensions inequality and this inequality. And you don't need anything else. And then, okay, like I was sweeping things under the rug. So there are other cleverness. There, there is other cleverness going on. So one of the things that I didn't talk about is this coupling between V hat. So here uh, we had V hat and V hat depends on P hat. It depends on the same sample. So you can try to apply some more conservative inequalities, but this very clean technique of just using Hovding or Bernstein's inequality that relied on that this function V was not dependent on p hat because otherwise you would have correlated samples so in the xi recall uh the definition of xi where is this xi definition like this is the xi definition if i put the hat here everything falls apart the xi is not independent anymore they are coupled because the values use all the samples and then there is a clever decoupling technique uh, that you can use. Uh, it's like a little bit too much to go into the details of that, but long story short, this dependence happened to be uh, very weak and you can prove that in general, this is a weak dependence in the sense that you can, you almost have the same deviation as you derive from applying Bernstein uh, when there is no dependence, you can get almost the same inequality with some additional small terms, but the terms are not much bigger. It's like a log one over one minus gamma price uh, is added to the whole thing. Um, and that, that's based on some really clever construction. I will give you pointers to uh, where this construction is. It's, uh, it's quite nice. Um, okay, so that's that's the gist of how you can improve uh, the sample complexity from this h to the six to h to the fourth first, and then eventually h to uh, the third. And then the second question is, is this tight? Right. So is there a better, like it's just a loose way, like uh, this This was uh, applicable to any argotum that, you know, like just optimizes based on this model. Doesn't actually have to be the model. Uh, as we say, like you can choose any model, which is within this confidence range that we didn't quite compute, but like you can, you know, uh, the data tells you that the transition probabilities should be uh, up to a certain range, up to a certain region. It doesn't tell you exactly what. 
the transitions should be. Uh, it just tells you that with high probability the transitions fall into this re uh, region, and you could choose any any transition probabilities from that region pessimistically, optimistically. Doesn't matter how. Uh, you can solve for the resulting uh, MDP, and you get these bonds. Um, but maybe this is loose. Uh, so is it loose or not loose? So I'm not going to present a full proof, but I'm going to present a sketch of the main ideas. So it starts with uh, just thinking about what happens if we have a bunch of Bernoulli's So this is a binary probability of seeing one is P and there are ID. And then you calculate the sample mean and the deviation from P. And if you, okay, so we just learned about Bernstein's inequality, right? So Bernstein's inequality tells you that this is of the range uh, of square root, and then the variance of one of the guys should go under the square root, right? So if I bring a, bring sigma under the square root, it becomes sigma square. So that's the variance. So what's the variance of, of x1? Uh, Anyone? What's the variance of a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p? Yeah, it's p times 1 minus p. It's going to be p times 1 minus p log 1 over or 2 over zeta or whatnot. Kind of ignorant of this. Plus, maybe some, some term. It happens that for Bernoulli's, you can actually uh, basically remove these terms. So there is some technique, maybe you worsen this constant too a little bit. Uh, doesn't matter that much. All right. Um, you may be wondering about whether there is any, any, any other better way of estimating the mean of a Bernoulli random variable. It turns out to be that there is no better way. This is kind of the best, the sample mean. Maybe it's not too surprising. And you can make this rigorous, and uh, maybe some homework exercises are going to be about that. We'll give you hints of how to make things like this rigorous. But now just believe me that this deviation is, is like the real range, like no one can improve upon this, right? So uh, this, this bound is tight. Um, and then what we can do is that, okay, we, not, we want to explain in this bound a bunch of things. All right, so, uh, so first of all, transition probability estimation is like estimating this P parameter, like this Bernoulli parameter, because maybe you have some critical probability of whether you stay in a state or you're going somewhere else and like that, that's like a probability that you need to estimate, right? So somehow they're connected. This is probability estimation. It's like the simplest probability estimation that you can imagine. And so uh, it's kind of believable that uh, like the question whether you can improve upon this is somehow connected to whether like how well you can estimate uh, the mean of a Bernoulli random variable. And so we can ask the question, okay, like how many samples do I need uh if i want an estimate which is epsilon accurate why epsilon accurate so here the optimization error uh so epsilon was the uh the the suboptimality level the desired suboptimality level of the policy but if you uh if you can solve the the policy optimization problem so you can come up with an algorithm that you know sample efficiently uh, figuring out what policy to choose, then you can use that. 
to estimate the values as far. So we can ask questions, okay, like, uh, can we estimate the values up to an epsilon accuracy? Uh, if you get a lower bound for this, that should be a lower bound for policy optimization as well. O optimizing is, is not easier than estimating. And so uh, now we need to check whether, uh, like, how long does it take for us um, to, to ensure that this interval is smaller than or equal to epsilon. So inverting this uh, gives you that this is um, bigger than <coughs> p times 1 minus p log 2 over zeta over epsilon squared. So we kind of see where the epsilon squared is coming from. If we could do better than this one over epsilon squared, maybe we could estimate, you know, the mean of a Bernoulli random variable much better than what is reasonable. So how about like SA? Well, they just say that maybe you have a problem with, uh, where you have to estimate, you know, some probability for each state action pair. So you kind of, you, you want, we wanted to have a policy that works no matter what state you are in. So you need to look at all the state action pairs. So it's like you, you have to have some samples for each because you want uniform errors. So it's like it, it's it's pretty clear that something like that SA should be there. It's less clear that like there is an SA here as well. Uh, and then there was this zero here. Uh, but that this log SA should be there. Even that log SA, you can prove that it has to be there, but I'm not going to go into it. Uh, I think it's more interesting to think a little bit about where is this H cube is coming from, like in the lower bound. That's kind of the interesting question. And for that, it's enough to think about some really, really simple case where you want to estimate the value. Oh, where you want to estimate a value in a silly MDP. Seriously, MDP. This MDP, uh, you have two states, and for the first state, with probably DP, no matter what action you choose, you stay. And with probability one minus P, you transition to the other state, and if you're in the other state, then uh, with probability one, uh, you stay in that state. Here, whenever you make a transition, okay, sorry, whenever you make a transition here, you're staying, then you get a reward of one. Um, and then here, um, Whenever um, you're making a transition, you, you get the reward of zero. So what's the value here? So what's the Q value or V value or whatnot of the two states? So there is state one, there is state two. Well, clearly the value of state two is zero. What about the value of state one? Well, we can write a Bauman equation for that, right? So it's probably um, P we get a reward, and then we end up with state one. Oh, but we are discounted. And with probability one minus P, we don't get a reward, and we end up in state two, which has a value of zero. 
All right, solving this for Mr. One. Mr. One is going to be um, hmm. Okay, okay. I I I I changed the problem. We get the reward here as well. Like, why not? Whenever we make transition, we we, we get the reward. Uh, so then um, we have this, right? So we start off one is equal to one over one minus PG. So I need for we start one. Okay. So. How accurately can we estimate the value of Easter one? Well, it depends on P. So let, let me index this by P. So this is really a function of P. To figure out how sensitive you are to the errors in P, well, you do. We're not talking about proving. Uh, we're talking about just like getting a sense of things. So if you want to know how sensitive you are to some parameter, what do you do? What operation um, the input should be giving you an answer to sensitivity questions? Sensitivity of some parameter. Take the derivative. Yes, good, thanks. Um, so let's take the derivative uh, with respect to p of v star p1. So that's the derivative, right? Um, negative and negative of gamma. So it's like gamma over one minus gamma p squared. Aha. Uh -huh. So what does it, this differentiation mean? Well, it means that p star p1 minus if I, so what's the best way of estimating v star? Well, you see this data, like you were sampling, so that's going to be your CDMDP. So you, you, you collect a bunch of transitions at state one. That's the only thing that you don't know here. And then you need to estimate the value of V star. You can dream about whatever estimators, but the best, best thing is going to be the plugin estimator, right? So let's just think a little bit about the plugin estimator after, um, Sorry, it's 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 just like you you got this uh, x one x n uh, Bernoulli's right. So those are the transitions. The plugin estimator would calculate the mean of these uh, parameters. And that's your MDP estimate, and then you calculate okay how well are we going to do? And you want to know if I do that, okay? Sorry, it's um, x bar n. If I do that. Uh, how big is the deviation of the estimated value compared to the true value? Am I going to be accurate? So you don't accurate, you can force some error. So you want this to be absolutely accurate. So then Taylor's theorem comes to mind. If you take the derivative and like some value in between. So long story short, this is very close to, if you're doing since well, the derivative. of uh, v star p1 um, times the deviation between the parameter. So differentiation is just this big device that allows you to write linear expressions. So we already understand that this deviation is of the size of p1 over p, p, p1 minus p log blah, 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 2n. 
And if you want to understand how big an error we make with this plugin estimates, then we just have to calculate the derivatives. And we did calculate the derivatives, so I just plug them in. Um, so we get we get this. And uh, so we want to see whether this is smaller than or equal to epsilon. So are we epsilon accurate? And then we, we can invert for n. And, and you see that like it's almost one over one minus gamma squared, except that there is also this p and that p over there. It's like we have to choose some p parameter to see the dependence on one over one minus gamma working out the best for us. And then here we have to think about what was the best choice for p. p was a, a free parameter. Uh, what's the best choice for p? Well, we want this guy to be close to one minus gamma. So, well, we only care about the case when gamma goes to, to one. And when gamma goes to one, then like this one minus gamma p should be close to one minus gamma. So that gives us the idea that, that maybe p should be, uh, chosen as a function of uh, of gamma and uh, p should um, right to also uh, get closer to one as um, so P, um, we better make sure that P gets to one as gamma gets to one. So here's here's your gamma, here's your range, here's your P, and we need to design this function and and somehow we uh, so the P has to be between zero and one. And uh, okay, so what are simple functions? I don't know. Like, you can choose some function like this. Right, uh, so it's basically uh, with an increase in gamma, p is uh, going to increase to one. Um, so we could choose, I don't know, p equals uh, one minus gamma half or something like that. So then this is going to be one minus gamma half, which is one minus gamma plus gamma squared over two. Oh, hold on. No, 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 no. This is this is silly. Uh, okay. So this, uh, so first of all, this this was not a good choice <laughs> because when gamma equals one, this is this is not doing like uh, this is an increasing function, right? Like, uh, and this is the increasing function of gamma. So what, what am I doing here? That's silly. Um, so we we'll need to choose an increasing function.
-hmm. And we also want um, Sure, but does uh, one plus gamma over two work? That's the function that you drew there. Yeah. Or I meant the whole thing over two. Huh? Maybe it should be the whole thing over two, like one plus gamma whole thing over two. So when gamma equals one, it is equal to one. And when gamma is equal to zero, then it's equal to right, one. Right. It's one half. That's comma half. Um, yeah, I think that that works. Yeah. One minus comma, and then. OK, um, so we want to write this. Um, as like one plus comma minus one over two. Okay. The reason I want to write it such a way so that it's clear that This is one minus gamma plus gamma times gamma minus one over two. Um, yeah, is this a lower term? Not really. Okay, some variation of this such that this should be of a lower order term compared to the minus gamma when gamma goes to one. I think I have to be more aggressive like this. So for example, um, um, right, so uh, if this is your P gamma, then, um, Okay, so this is like four third minus one over three over gamma. So that's that's this function, right? So this is equal to one plus one third okay so one minus gamma p is equal to one minus gamma I'm over complicating this. Okay, so this is one minus gamma. 
and uh, times two third. Whoop. Okay. So we lose a constant factor. So one minus gamma p is not really one minus gamma, but okay, it's one minus gamma over times two third. And at the same time, one minus p gamma times p gamma. What is that? Well, p gamma was this guy. So one minus p gamma is one third one minus gamma over gamma times uh, p gamma. So that's four gamma minus one divided by three gamma. So as gamma goes to uh, one, so that, that's the range where we are interested in this. Then these are, oh, sorry, uh, this is constant. This is a constant. This is like three, actually, this is like one, approximately. This is also one. So this is approximately one third, one minus gamma. All right, so now we can plug in into this expression. Um, So this is equal to, so I dropped the gamma, one minus gamma p squared. That was one minus gamma squared, two thirds squared. Well, okay, that's a constant. I could have dropped it. And then there is p times one minus p, and that was just approximately one third, one minus gamma. And then there is the log terms over whatever constant to n. And now I need to solve that this is uh, smaller than epsilon. From this I get, well, the point is that here you have a one minus gamma and here you have a one minus gamma squared. So all together you have one minus gamma one half. And so n has to be, uh, three cube epsilon squared times log. Okay. So the reason this works is because if you're in this discounted problem, the values can be sensitive to uh, the estimation errors of the transition probabilities up to really what we calculated here of an order of essentially one over one minus gamma squared. At the same time, we can only force that when P goes to, to one um, and when P goes to one, then Bernstein's inequality, this term is kind of like not there, and then you actually get this other term. Uh, but if you carefully calculate everything, then, uh, then you see that uh, the actual sensitivity is so that this, this one minus P becomes, uh, since P goes to one, it becomes uh, the same thing as one minus gamma. And uh, that's the heuristic reasoning. That's the end of uh, heuristically reasoning about why the sample complexity is, is going to depend cubically on the horizon. So it's like this sensitivity, value sensitivity to transition problem at uh, transition parameters. Um, and, and, that at the edge, uh, 
when um, when the transition parameters are getting close to one, you can estimate things much faster. So that's benchless inequality tells you that you can do that. If you try the same reasoning with Hovding's inequality, you would drop this one minus p. You would think that the lower bound should be h to the power of four. That's not the case. And that's because uh, as like the only way to force this sensitivity uh, to be the largest is when the transition properties also go to one uh, whenever the discount factor and the horizon goes to one. So the lower bond and an upper bond together establish this. This is this is how things are. All right, I'm way over time, and I didn't have time to talk about the third thing. I just drew one picture, and and I will post some link. Uh, really sorry about this. Uh, the picture is should should tell you everything. So that's that's the third part. So it's gonna be this MDP. But there is a chain. And the length of the chain is is pawn, is, is exact, exactly this critical length of age. So age is age gamma epsilon. So here we are doing trajectory sampling. And someone chooses this behavior policy. And we can always make it so that the first action at every state is the action whose uh, action probability is the smallest. So it's the minimum. And, uh, and because the probability is sum to one, it follows that This has to be smaller than one over A. So for every behavior policy that you can imagine, for every state, you can always find an action, such that the probability assigned to that action is at most one over A. Just choose the probability, the smallest probability. Can't be larger than one over A. Um, and so we're gonna create this MDP where these actions, this action one, which is which is without loss of charity assigned the smallest probability, is the one that kind of makes progress towards this state. So there is this special state. And in this state, the reward is going to be either plus one or minus one plus some, uh, some, some noise, some W. Uh, and the W is, is going to be standard normal with this, this variance of one. And uh, so if you choose action one, then you go down on a chain. And the MDP is going to be deterministic. Uh, and if you choose any other action, if in the initial state you choose some other action, you go to this other state. And, and here, this is an absorbing state. You get nothing. You get zero, right? So, uh, so not equal to one goes here. And not equals to one from every of this state goes back to the start state. So the probability that if you're generating a trajectory and this trajectory is going to hit this state, uh, if the trajectory has a length of age, is at most one over a to the power of age, because for each of the age steps, the trajectory has to select this specific action that has the smallest probability, this one over a probability at most. So the probability that uh, you're hitting this state is at most one over a to the power of age. And now I make this state really important. Uh, it's at the critical length, so it's important to know whether the reward that is plus one or minus one. If it's a plus one reward, it has a reward of mean plus one, then you want to go this way. If it's a minus one, you don't want to go this way. So policy optimization algorithm, which is uh, epsilon correct, 
with this discount factor needs to discover the, the nature of this reward. But if we do this trajectory sampling, then the probability of hitting this state along any of these trajectories at most one over A to the power of H. And uh, so it follows that if you, want, if you need to figure out um, what's the value of this state, how many trajectories are we going to need? Well, the value difference between a plus one and y, well, that's a constant difference. We want to uh, um, observe, um, op we want to make an observation on this black state uh, a constant number of times. Just to get one observation, you need at least inverse to this probability. So there is this P, P naught, right? So you need N to be the inverse of P naught uh, just to get one observation. And so from that, you can see that no argument will be able to get uh, whether it should go up or should go down from this initial state unless the number of trajectories sampled is at least a to the power of h, right? So that, that's, again, a heuristic reasoning, but you can firm it up. And, and it shows this exponential separation between sampling uh, by controlling where to sample, but passively, versus sampling just by following policies. All right, any questions for this? All right, maybe we can stop recording.